Thank you very much. Um, the uh, topic today, as, as Bob mentioned, is crisis communications uh, with a little bent on how to handle the media in the event of a crisis situation. And it, we label it as it, it's not if, it's when. Because we all know, we all work in, a, in the construction industry, it's going to be a, it's just a matter of time. You're not going to have the, the luxury of sitting back and saying, oh, OK, I hope this doesn't happen. Uh, so that's what we want to talk about today. And, and before we even get started, uh, one thing I will say is uh, ask questions. Please don't wait till the end. Don't don't hesitate. If something something comes up and you, you see on the screen and it doesn't quite make sense, ask, please. You won't throw me off. We'll 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 address it and, and then move on. Um, I like these to be interactive uh, because it, it, admittedly, all of us have different uh, experiences as it relates to uh, crisis situations. Um, and I'm going to share some of my crisis experiences as well, um, from a variety of construction related issues to nuclear um, and even non construction uh, related issues. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's get started. And again, please ask questions. Don't hesitate. Um, my only sales pitch for the day uh, we are a, we're a small uh, marketing firm. We tell stories for people who make things, who build things. And we are uh, located in Swickley. We have another office in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And we really focus on a variety of aspects from marketing, public relations, social media, design, web, all the fun things that make my life uh, a little bit fun at times. I promise no more sales pitches. I promise. Uh, a little bit about me, just some background. Uh, I started the company in 2008. Uh, prior to that, I served as a spokesperson for a variety of companies. Uh, I led the communications on the closing of the Fort Pitt Bridge and Tunnel. Uh, so I've been around construction uh, for my entire career, my professional career. My first job actually out of college was marketing and communications for a general contractor. And then I went and worked for an engineering firm. So I've been around uh, construction pretty much from day one in terms of my professional career. Uh, some of the people that I've worked with, the city of Pittsburgh, uh, Zippo Manufacturing, I'll talk a little bit about them in terms of some of the crisis that we handled for them. Um, one of the biggest ones up there is the, the Flight 93 Memorial. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll incorporate that into our discussion as well. Um, Dow Chemical and Westinghouse were some, some fun ones as well. Um, try to share that with you a little bit, but without boring you boring to tears as well. Um, as I said before, managed a lot of crisis situations um, in a variety of elements. So again, we'll, we'll move on. You don't need to hear that from me anymore. But um, the idea here is, is we, we've done some things. <laughs> and, and we've been able to manage some, some, some expectations and more importantly, reputations. So what, I, what I'd like to get for, for you today is the expectation of what we're going to accomplish today. Because again, I've done this. So I want this to be something for you that you can walk out of here with uh, a little bit more confidence as it relates to uh, discussing things with the media or even managing a crisis situation. Uh, in the past, we've given this, situ the, this seminar to other uh, contractors in particular. And the very first, I, I got to this slide and honestly, the very first thing came up and said, I'm not talking to the media. They don't understand us. They don't know what, how, how we talk. They don't know our language. Uh, and that's fair. That's a fair assessment. However, my response was, well, that's because you're talking two different languages. So that's one of the expectations. At the end of today, you're going to be a very, you should be comfortable, at least my hope is that you'll be comfortable in how to make that response, how to talk with the media, how to talk to a reporter. Um, what do you do when a camera's in your face, kind of like today <laughs> um, for me? We'll also talk about speaking with a goal in mind. It's not just a matter of going out there and having the, the, the discussion about what happened on a job site or in your office or, as Bob mentioned, a vehicle. It's having a specific goal in mind, and we'll talk about that as well. And then the last thing here is managing the conversation so that your message is understood. And I come back to that ref, uh, the reference that I gave previously. If we're talking the same language and we understand what the media is looking for, we can give them things that will help uh, tell the story, but more importantly, move the crisis along so that you can focus on what, whatever that crisis is. So any questions? 
Any other expectations from you? I'm going to ask you a question, so be prepared. Okay. <clears throat> so, what is a crisis? And I know if we go around the room, everybody's going to have a different opinion. But uh, we chose this, this image, and if you can see it, it's a you know, storm on the horizon. And a lot of people think about crisis in that way. It's on the horizon. I, I don't have to worry about it. Um, I can tell you just from experience, there is going to be times when it's going to be in, in, in your lap, in your face, and it's going to affect not only you, but it's also going to affect your employees, your staff, uh, the people you work with. Um, unfortunately, just what we saw over the weekend with a helicopter crash in California, um, yes, everyone's mourning Kobe Bryant, but today I started to hear things, people talking about the kids that were on that helicopter. Um, so my point of that is the crisis is going to hit. It's going to affect so many different people. So um, in terms of what is a crisis, does anyone have a definition? Thoughts? All right. I'm going to wake you up. I will. I promise. So a crisis is basically, well, one, it's stressful. You know, it hits the fan. <laughs> and it's a matter of, okay, what do we do here? How do we handle this? Um, it's a disruption, not only to your, to your daily operations, but it could have an impact long beyond that day, that individual day. Uh, and, and more importantly, it's going to damage your brand. It will. Uh, I, hate to say, I hate to say that in so matter-of-factly, but there is an impact on your brand. And, and what we tell people from a marketing perspective is our job is twofold. Our job is to tell a story, but more importantly, our job is to help people make a decision. And as that relates to construction, that decision is whether I hire company A or company B. And more importantly, go beyond that. So when I say it's a potential brand damaging event, somebody could easily go back and say, hey, you know, I remember XYZ contractor, they built, you know, the PNC tower downstairs or downtown downstairs. Um, and there was a problem. I remember that. So the challenge with a crisis is, is nobody remembers the good stuff. Everybody remembers the bad stuff. And we all know that. And then lastly, there is more than likely going to be a media response. Uh, you know, think back to New Orleans a few, I think it was a year ago, maybe, maybe 18 months ago, when the Hard Rock, uh, Hard Rock Casino, the scaffolding fell. Um, that was international news. I'll be honest with you, I was in Germany, and that was the morning news. So it wasn't just a, a New Orleans story or a, na a national story. That damaged that company's brand. But I'll define the crisis for us, and that is a potential brand damaging incident that requires a media response. And that definition is kind of how we'll move forward in our discussion today. Okay. Any questions? Any thoughts? I know somebody wants to say something. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. <laughs> okay. So here's my question for you. First question of the day. How many of you have experienced a crisis? Okay. All right, that's good. Uh, hopefully, you'll going as we go through this today. You'll you'll go back to when that crisis was. Hopefully, it wasn't too too long ago. But you'll be able to look back today and say, okay, here's some things that I can do to to manage this when it happens again. So um, now that we have kind of an understanding of how many people have handled the crisis, and, and honestly, I'm surprised that not everybody's hand went up. So good for you um, for those that de haven't dealt with a crisis. Um, it's funny, I gave this, uh, I gave this presentation in, in Hershey uh, in the fall, and I was shocked. Only two people's hand went up. And, it was the, and it was, there were 60 people in the room, and they were all safety officers. And I literally had to beg them, like, come on. There's no way that two people out of 60 have ever dealt with a crisis. If not, you wouldn't be here. And then all of a sudden, the hands went up. So understanding that a crisis does have such a major impact on, on people's business, on people's lives, um, that's where we want to move forward with, okay? Okay, now we're starting to get into some, some, some fun things here. Um, one of the things, and a lot of this is, is foundational information so that we can move forward and then we'll start to really dive into to how the, you know, the tips and tricks uh, for, for dealing with the media. But 
During a crisis, people are going to do three things. They're either going to perceive the information differently, they're going to absorb it. I'm sorry, I'm saying this wrong. They're going to absorb information differently, they're going to process the information differently, and then they're going to act on the information differently. And the reason that this is important is once we understand that, now we can start to move forward with how are we going to respond. Um, uh, this was probably 20 years ago. I'm probably, I'm kind of dating myself. Anybody remember the DC sniper situation? Um, Hannah's the youngest person in the room and she, under, she, she remembers. Thank you. Um, so that's good. Uh, there was a chief bull was his name and he was the police chief for that, the town that was being uh, terrorized. It was evident the first time he went on, on, on camera, he was talking like a police officer. And unfortunately, that whole situation took, took place over six weeks, eight weeks over the summer. And you could literally see his progression as he got better and better talking to the media, because let's be honest, not many police officers are engaged with the media. But what happened was he started to realize that what he was saying was impacting not only the investigation, but it was also impacting the news and how they were covering it. And so that's why I want to bring this up here. Absorbing information differently, acting on that information and processing it is going to be helpful when you consider how to tell the story as it relates to the crisis. Any questions? All right. So here's the most important slide, I think, in, in our discussion today. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, is information in today's, today's society is currency. And we already understand how people collect that information. But having the currency and, and having the ability to understand that what you are saying and what you are talking about, what you are owning in terms of that information that you're sharing during a crisis, that becomes the currency that you currently are using and you are sharing that information or that currency, if you will, with the media, with your employees, with your stakeholders, with potentially the owner of the, of the project, all of, that, all of the people that need to know information. And that's where the mindset shift occurs. Um, from the standpoint of thinking about the information that you have for the crisis situation, um, thinking of it as currency, that helps people understand that there are much more opportunities to inform people and educate them on what you're actually doing. So for example, if there is a crisis on a, on, a, on a job site, and let's say there was a fatality, you always want to go out and talk about your safety record and the things that you've done before this. You want to reinforce that. And that's what, when I say information is currency, that's what I'm talking about. Utilizing the information or your past record as the currency to help people understand that this is a one-time thing or um, a freak accident. Like I said before, um, our job is to tell stories and those stories are to help people make those decisions. And those decisions are very, very simple. Work with my company or not. And as we're moving forward through the crisis situation, the, you know, the story arc, if you will, of that crisis situation really starts to peak when all of the information is available and now you can pull people away from the actual crisis and you're now moving people into the decision-making process that will help them and help your company move forward. And that's why we say that currency aids in that decisions. Um, and, but mo most important, and I think the, the biggest thing on this slide that is, again, reinforces that mindset shift is that in a crisis, you have an opportunity. You have a variety of opportunities, not just one, but you have that opportunity to strengthen your, your reputation. Um, we talk about, um, there's so many different case studies on crisis situations and you know, classic things, uh, but having the ability to process and, and go through that crisis management situation and then come out on the other end with a solid, uh, strong reputation 
is a great opportunity for brands, for companies, for contractors, for architects and engineers as well. And another opportunity is to share your story. You know, one of the things that up until this point, we've been talking about building a crisis plan. We've talked about how people process information. We talk about information as currency. You've done all these things. You developed a great plan. Why wouldn't you go out and share your story? Here's an opportunity to, to, to remind people and, and again, make that, help them make that decision that you're the company they need to work with. Most importantly, you have the ability to imp the opportunity to impact the media coverage. And that's really what we're talking about today. But lastly, in, in, in the, the influencing the media coverage and shaping public perception really go hand in hand. And those opportunities are, again, built around having the right information, saying them in the, in the right process, and then more, most importantly, saying the same thing is, as your story evolves so that people again, are able to make the decision as to whether I want to work with you or not. So real quick, like I said in the previously, you know, corporate reputation has an impact on sales, profit, all of the things that business is designed to do. So there are a variety of ways that the uh, reputations are measured. And the biggest one up here is the response to issues as it relates to today. Um, we could give a seminar on, on each one of these topics, um, but we're, again, we're here to talk about the response to an issue. And then more importantly, there are a couple examples. Um, I, could go into some, I could go into a lot of detail on each of these, but probably the biggest one is the Tylenol case. Um, back in the early 80s, I believe it was um, 81, 82, um, somebody decided that they were going to put cyanide in Tylenol. And it became a massive story. It started in Chicago and grew. Um, but the way that Tylenol handled it uh, was the biggest boost to their, uh, their, their next wave of sales. And, and they actually got through the year once they, once they got the problem solved and then actually had boosted profits. Uh, I think if I remember reading it, it was something like 5% over the previous year before the incident. Um, but it was how they managed the response. And in fact, the very first thing the CEO did is he came on and he said, we're wiping all our Tylenol capsules, capsules off the shelves. Um, pretty bold move, um, but nonetheless, that was necessary to respond to the issue. And I just bring that up as an example of how corporate reputation can impact things. All right. I promise I'm slowing down now because this is the part where we really want to start to dive in a little bit more here. The biggest thing that I can tell you about managing a crisis is to prepare. You cannot just walk up to the podium, the stage, in front of a reporter and expect, one, the conversation to be understood, and then more importantly, to make sure that you are saying everything that you want to be heard. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that in a second, but I can't emphasize enough the preparation component of preparing for a crisis. I know it's not exactly the sexiest thing to talk about. Um, it's not exactly the fun thing to talk about as you're talking in, in business and going from whether you're estimating a project to um, completing a project, handing over the keys. But it's, as, it, as our title is, it's not if, it's when, and it's going to happen. So let's talk a little bit about preparing. I know the answer to the first question, because everybody here has a safety program in place, correct? Everybody's head's moving. Good. OK. 100% on that one. Is it up to date? When was the last time you looked at your safety program and actually employed all of the tactics that are necessary to successfully go, th go through your safety program? And then we'll add a, add a little twist to that. Is there a crisis communications component within your safety program? I'll give you an example. I worked, my first job out of college, I worked for a general contractor in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, the middle of Amish country. And I was working for a contractor who won the bid for the first Walmart in Lancaster County. And if anyone is familiar with Lancaster County at the time, that was a huge thing because <laughs> 
God bless you. That was the whole idea of corporation coming in and taking over mom and pops and all this other stuff. Well, we had protests on a job site, all sorts of different things that, that I got to handle, so it was fun. But there was one day, it was about four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and we were still excavating, and got a phone call, came in to me, and they said, we have a little bit of a problem on the job site. I said, okay, is someone injured? Is there a death? Is, what do we have to do? And no, there, there isn't, but a rock got loose. And I think to myself, why is this a problem if a rock got loose? Well, I didn't find out until about five minutes later. It was about a three foot in diameter rock that had shot through a fissure and as they were excavating. And on the one side of the property was a road. Well, this three foot in diameter rock had took off, missed a man's head by millis millimeters, took off the headrest of his seat and embedded itself in the back seat of his car. And on top of that, the man driving the car was the photographer editor for the local newspaper. Yes! We hit the trifecta on that one. Um, I shouldn't have said that, that was bad, that was horrible. Um, but all of a sudden, now we're in the middle of a crisis situation that we had never even thought of. Who would have thought that excavating a three foot rock would have lunged itself out of the ground at such a high velocity to take off the head of a seat rest and go to town? So we went into crisis mode. We start handling this and we're managing it and we're talking. My job, I was out talking to the reporters who were automatically on the job. They actually beat me to the construction site, if you can imagine that. Um, again, photography editor. He calls the police, then he calls the news desk at, the, at his office. Um, and again, I, I'm literally, you know, two years out of college, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, this is it. This is great. I've managed, I'm ready for this, you know. I'm, I'm, I can talk to the reporters. I can do these things. Well, the next day in the newspaper, there is a picture of this man standing next to a, you know, he's got his arm on the car like this. There's a massive hole, and his car headrest is no that is not there. And the story is benchmark benchmark rocks Walmart. That was the name and benchmark was the name of the company. Um, and great. Here I am thinking I could handle this. Uh, no. Mm -mm. It became the top story all week the following week. The only saving grace was that it happened on a Friday night. And it was a slow, slow, it was over the weekend. Um, so my point of all of this is, when I say, is your safety program up to date? <coughs> you need to really, really think about what are some of the potential issues that could affect your business. So I want to take a quick break here and I want to ask, what are some of the crisis situations that, since we're at this point in the discussion now, what would, what would you consider some crisis situations as it affects your business? Just off the top of your head. And, and I will say this, let, let's throw out um, uh, death or injury. Environmental. OK. Collapse of the building. Collapse, environmental. Anything else? Yes. So we'll, we'll call that one loco. Yeah. How's that? So we've got environmental, collapse, loco, and you had one? Uh, protest or vandalism. Protest or vandalism, okay. So uh, we've got four. Any, any others? Okay. Employees steal something valuable from your client. That's a huge one. 
I, I know that's, that's huge, not only here, but across the whole country. So uh, vandalism, okay, so let, let, let's use one of these examples as we move forward in our discussion. So again, we're, we're preparing for something. We've sat around, and, and this, is, this is gonna be a challenge for, for, for some of your executive leadership, I'll be honest with you, is you're gonna sit there and say to them, okay, we need to think about what are some potential issues, whether it's a crazy person, somebody stealing something, uh, scaffolding collapse, protesters, we need to think about all of this. And, and that's, that's the point I want to try to make is because no matter how much you prepare, no matter how much you think the standard uh, injuries, fatalities, uh, falls, uh, those type of things, something out of the blue is going to happen. So let, which one do you think? What, I'll let you guys pick. Which topic do we want to use moving forward? Environmental, collapse, theft, protests, and crazy people. Danielle, you pick. Oh, yeah. uh, let's do theft. Okay, theft. So we're going to go through this and use theft as our example. Okay. So the first thing that we would go through as we're preparing, helping companies prepare their crisis communications plan is, what do, do I know what to do when a crisis hits? So what are we going to do when theft occurs? And, and for the sake of this discussion, let's define theft not as a hammer or a screwdriver or something like that. Let's do it as, let's, let's say it's a truck. Does that make sense? Disgruntled employee, we'll, we'll create a crisis here. Disgruntled employee um, gets fired on the job and just takes off with a truck and says, <coughs> the hell with you. Um, I'm sure that's happened multiple times, but uh, we'll use that as our example. So first question. How would we respond to that crisis? How would we respond to a disgruntled employee stealing a company uh, vehicle? Call the police. Right, right. That's one. Insurance. Two, insurance. Here's the first thing we're not going to do. We're, gonna go, we're not going to go after that guy, assuming it's a guy. We're not going to go after them. We're going to let the authorities handle that. And we're going to start to handle the messaging. So we're going to start to talk to our employees. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna acknowledge the fact that something happened. So yes, on, on XYZ job site, a vehicle was, was stolen. We want to reinforce our company's policies on theft and really try to twist this into an opportunity to talk about our company's policies on theft and make it a bigger issue while the police and the authorities and, and insurance are investigating the situation so that we can continue to communicate to our employees. Does this make sense? Okay, all right, good. And under the situation, can my business survive? Yeah, we can survive getting by for a little bit of time without that vehicle, unless there was a lot of equipment in it or something that was specific to that job site. Um, but again, Based on this situation, we'll just, we'll just keep moving forward, okay? Any questions? All right. Did you also inform the owner? I assume, like, if it, especially yeah. if it affects their, um, let's say that he stole a truck and you were at Duquesne University's campus, and he stole a Duquesne truck. Mm -hmm. My, my take on it is the more you communicate, the better it is. So you're absolutely right. The owner should be notified uh, and let them know that not only is the situation being investigated, but this is what we're doing on our end. Um, and I know this is, a, this is a different thought for contractors. I know this is a different thought because typically if something like this would happen, you close up and say, hey, no, this is, this, we're dealing with this on our own. Um, but you're, that's a very good point. We, we need to, to address the owners and, and, and communicate with them because it's their job site, right? So that, thank you for that. That's a, that was a good point. Um, so part of this preparation in, in what we're talking about here is, is to establish a crisis communications plan as well. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? good. Um, part of that crisis communications plan is to, to establish kind of what we just went through. Again, Talk with the owner, thank you. Call the insurance, 
call the police, and then communicate to your staff and let them know and reinforce that this is not acceptable behavior. Um, and then as we're going through this crisis communications plan, when we're developing this, there's a variety of things. So we'll have messaging, we'll have um, spokesperson uh, guidelines, we'll have uh, opportunities to really have your team pulling together and going through different roles and responsibilities as well. But the biggest thing here is review, practice, and update. Just like I said earlier on, the, um, on the, your safety communications plan. Um, you know, you've got to review and update it regularly. Uh, and, and I would encourage you too, when there is a situation that you read about in the paper, um, the sinkhole that occurred in August, September, uh, in, um, right across from the convention center, uh, that's a time to kind of look back and say, what do we do if that was our truck? Not, not just a Port Authority bus, but what would we do if that was our truck driving through there? Um, and it, it can be a simple 15 minute conversation. Doesn't need to be hours and hours of meetings, but just a matter of asking questions. Um, and and you know, I'll give you another example too. Um, long time ago, I was working with the iron workers. Um, the business manager at the time calls me up and he says, hey, we've got a little bit of a problem. I said, okay, is there a problem? Again, standard response, is there an injury? Is there a death? And he said, no, but our guys at the convention center were working and Part of the floor collapsed. Oh, that's not good. Again, anyone hurt? No. The in interesting thing <laughs> was there was a delivery truck who, uh, who they were obviously making deliveries, and for some reason, that section of the concrete, the rebar or the, the, the concrete itself wasn't dry enough, and it just collapsed down from, I think it was the, the fourth floor to the third floor. And fortunately, the delivery truck, the bumpers on the front and end of the truck, the truck sunk, but the bumpers stopped it from going down to the third floor. And it was just amazing. I mean, here guys, you know, pulling up, all of a sudden he hears something, goes to get out, and the ground's right there. And that's exactly what the guy said in the paper. You know, this never happened to me before. Uh, so the, the, the crisis was we sat down with, the, with, the, with the Local 3, we talked with their attorney, we talked with the, their foreman, um, and, and we came together and really tried to figure out what the, what the issue was. And through the investigation, what we found out was that the concrete just hadn't dried. It had nothing to do with the rebar, it had nothing to do with any support pieces or anything like that. It just was a freak accident. Um, so then we crafted the message around that and were able to go out and start talking to the media because everybody wants to know when something like that happens. And, oh, and oh, one key thing I left out, it was while the, con the convention center had just opened. So it was like a month after the convention center had opened. So the concern was, can I park my car in the convention center? The Port Authority was a little bit nervous, <laughs> to say the least. So um, I always forget that part. I always got to remember that. But. The other side of this too, and, and, and I know there's a couple guys in, in, from insurance in here, Im implementing a uh, crisis communications plan has the potential, I want to say that again, has the potential to positively impact your insurance premiums and your health plans. It just depends on your policies. So that's another incentive to try to, to, to look at this. Just like you have a safety program, having a crisis communications plan as a potential to do that. So I always want to mention that we've, we've had some clients in the past that have, that have benefited from that. So any thoughts, comments? Okay. So real quick, kind of the, the, the typical plan, uh, define the crisis for yourself. I can sit up here and tell you all the crises that I've run into. Um, but the reality of it is, is for your specific company, there's going to be specific things. Uh, you know, if you're a roofer or a sheet metal worker compared to a general contractor, there's going to be a diff differing crises are going to be um, defined for your business. So I, I always want to emphasize that. Um, the second aspect of this, your crisis response team. That's your most critical component of a crisis communications plan because you've got to establish not only roles and responsibilities, but the most important thing 
It's just like I'm up here with one, one person talking to you today. You don't need to have five people talking. Yes? Correct. Uh, good question. So the first thing I'm going to you asked you said a couple things there. The first thing is I'm a huge proponent of not putting the CEO or president front and center. Um, the the aspect of trying to trying to protect that person um, is is highly visible. But more importantly, that person's responsibility is to run the business. And in a crisis situation, business is still going to continue. So uh, that's that's the main reason to have the president, CEO, not your spokesperson. Um, the the uh, second part of what you asked is having a, you know, a communications person or a um, mid-level manager uh, aspect, I think is probably the best, um, but making sure that that person is prepared. Uh, you want to make sure that, um, take a step back. The example I gave of the, the rock breaking loose, um, one of the very first things we did was we, we pulled together the president, the vice president, the project manager. Um, there was a couple estimators in the room, which, you know, okay, great. Um, myself and then our salesperson. And we all kind of came together. And the first question that came out of, of the president's mouth is, what's the worst thing that's going to happen today? And, and, and that's always a starting point that we move forward from there. So I would encourage whoever is in, the, in that in part of that team Ask that question. What's the worst that's going to happen? And then from there you can always, and then you back your way into it. Um, and then the third part of your question, what was the third part? You, I know you asked the third part. I'm just wondering, like, you were talking about the response team and, like, who you have in there. Um, like, you know, like, what is So um, you ask good questions. Thank you. <coughs> so as far as uh, developing the team, yes, I agree with you. You want to have department heads. Um, and, and it's funny, I, I gave this presentation in Hershey again in the fall, and the question was, well, do we need our finance person? Yes. Because again, business is going to continue. You want to have that person involved. So I, I would, the first thing I would say is for, for your response team is your, your, your leadership and department heads and then a communications person. And I have to admit, I kind of waver back and forth on, on having, having legal in there. Um, and a lot of the times what we do is we'll, we'll actually put in the plan, um, there'll be steps or, or um, we do it red, yellow, green. <laughs> and if we're, at, we're, if we're at red, the attorney's definitely in the room. Yellow, okay, green, we don't need the attorney. Um, and, and that's kind of how we, how, we, how we rate it that way. Um, but a lot of the, the responsibility of the crisis team, the response team, is to establish the policies and procedures on how you're going to do this. Um, you know, I'll, gi I'll give you another example that's outside of the construction industry. We worked with a healthcare uh, home human services group. Um, they had been around for 25 years and had never had a crisis communications plan. And literally, after the first meeting, within a week, uh, this is, I, I, I could not have scripted this better, honest to God. Within a week, they had five different incidents that, that le elevated to a crisis situation. Um, and so part of that plan, and, and when it came to the crisis response team, was department heads, executives, 
um, and, and their communications person, uh, but we ran through policies and procedures and, and how are we gonna handle something like this? So we tried to categorize things the best of our ability, so then that way you could say, okay, this is, this is a red level uh, event. We need, to, we need to get all hands on deck type of thing. Um, and, and one thing I do know too, on the, on the ga natural gas and energy industry, um, they're required to actually have a uh, war room or a, an operations center off site. Um, when we, I did a crisis uh, situation for EQT a few years ago, and a uh, house blew up, and they had uh, operations center off site. I don't think you need to do that for the construction industry, but yet nonetheless set aside a section in the office or uh, even if anything on your hard drive that you can quickly pull up and, and address and pull those things. Did you have something? I, I was just saying in, a, um, in relation to your question, you know, when you typically see an attorney on television, mm -hmm. it's at a trial, something like that. So the presence or lack there of an attorney in that situation will sort of bring your crisis you know, there's this, like, hey, we're guilty of something. You know what I mean? Just by having yeah, that legal would, presence there. So that's something that, that really requires some thought. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. like you said, yeah. that's step con five yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I would tell you, and, and I'm gonna, you're going to hear me say this in a future slide, you know, one of the biggest things, and I'll say it now and then I'll reiterate it again, there is no such thing. You never, ever use the word no comment. <clears throat> Please, dear God, do not say that because, to your point, no comment means we're guilty right off the bat. And more importantly, and we're going to go through this in a second, more importantly, you've worked on a plan. You've got your messages. You've now got the opportunity to share your side of the story. Why wouldn't you? So and, and, uh, to add to that one last thing, if you're going to put your attorney as your spokesperson, you've already lost. In the court of public opinion, as soon as an attorney is up there, you, he hit it right on the head. You have done something wrong. And that's one of the challenges that the construction industry fa faces because right away they're going to go to our attorney because we know our attorney is going to take care of us, or at least we hope so because we've got this relationship, all these attorneys have been around forever, all those things. But a simple statement can quickly end the situation as well. Okay? Any questions on that? Any additional thoughts? Thank you. That was good. No? Okay. So just to get back to this, get, get us back on track, your messaging. What are we going to say? Who are we going to say it to? How are we going to say it? Those are important elements of a communications plan. Your policies and procedures, I talked about that. And then your resources. You want to be able to have quick, easily accessible guidelines and checklists that you can simply look at and say, okay, we've done this. Um, I, I mentioned the crisis communications plan for the health and human services firm that we worked with. And it literally is, is this done? Yes, next. And, and you literally go through each checklist just like you would a project. So that's the other side of this is thinking of a crisis as a project and how are you going to manage it the whole way through. Fun part now, okay? Like I said before, in, that, in the seminar that I gave previously with the, with the contractors, and I, I keep bringing it up and I apologize, but I, I think it's important here. Media does not think like you do. The media actually thinks totally different. And we can go into a whole bunch of different things um, on the expectations and how, how reporters think, but the reality of it is they just think differently than you. I have this, my roommate from college is a reporter. He, um, he's a columnist for the Allentown Morning Call. And, uh, he, you know, we have this fight back and forth all the time. We get together and play golf every, every year, and he's always like, you know, you, you need to stop saying that. You know, like, well, it's true. You guys think differently. You know, and then by the end of the night, we're like, yeah, well, okay, we're good. But, but the reality of it is, is the media as a whole, whether there's a camera in front of you or a reporter sitting across from the table, they think differently. It's just simple. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how to handle that and how to, how to really manage that. So question for you. How many of you have granted a media interview? Okay, three people. All right. I have a feeling I know the response to this next question. How many of you have given a media interview during a crisis? One, two. All right. 
Okay, that's, that's good. Russ, is this making sense, what we're talking about here? Yeah, yeah. So far? Mm -hmm. I kind of put you on the spot, so I apologize. You know, one, one of the things, and I'm going back to when I was trying to get this one issue, was we corralled the media to one area only, so mm -hmm. they weren't from all over the project. And I went out there and just introduced myself and told them that the staff is looking into this, and since we know more, I'll get back to you, but please yep. stay back here. It's safe, and we'll get back. Yes. And that just bought me some time. Yes. And, and, and a lot of the times, that's what you want. You want to buy yourself some time so you can think. Right. And, and, and we're going to thank you, because we're going to get into that in a second. So the media expectations. So they have a job to do just like you do. Okay? And what they need to do is gather information. I said earlier, information is currency. So the reporter is looking to find that information, and they're going to talk to as many people as possible. So under our, under our scenario of a stolen vehicle, they're going to talk to the police. They're going to talk to the, probably the owner, as you said uh, earl, uh, earlier. They're going to want to talk to you. Um, really, the only person that they shouldn't be talking to is the person that stole it, but that's a whole other issue because sometimes they, they do. Um, but the reality of this is, is they are going to look for information in any way that they can. And they are going to ask their questions in so many different ways, but it's going to be the same question. And, and when we go through media training, that's one of the things that we talk about. We talk about the variety of, of, of questioning, um, excuse me, that comes about. Um, but really, it comes down to they want to gather information so that they can write their article. And the reality of it is, is they're on to the next thing. So if you keep that in mind, help them do their job and get them out. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, and so your expectations as it relates to an interview, uh, whether it's a, t a camera or a recording or a, um, a, a, a printed version, is you want to protect your business, obviously. You want to protect your, your, your business brand. You want to protect your personal brand as well. Um, you know, that's one of the things I learned as, uh, um, with the, as a spokesperson for Flight 93. Um, if you Google my name and Flight 93, you will see a lot of articles that call me a douchebag. Um, and I, yeah, hey, wow. Um, mainly because when this occurred, it was at the time of blogging and social media wasn't quite there yet, but this is the way people could combat things. And, but the point of all of this is you're now in, involved in a situation. You're now part of a story. And people are going to have a perception one way or another. So you, it's, 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 in, it's intrinsic on you to protect your own personal brand as well as your company as well. Um, I can take that name. That's no big deal. Uh, but again, we talked about developing a crisis communications plan. You want to follow that. You want to pull it out. You want to have it accessible and, and literally go through it step by step. A good crisis communications plan should literally take you from incentive, uh, not incentive, inception of the, of, of, the, of the situation or when you're notified all the way through to completion. And then the final expectation of of, of the media interview or the, the interaction is to share your side of the story. And that's a, that's a, a critical part of, of where we're going to go into, into our next discussion here. So any questions about the media at all? You guys are easy on me today. I like it. Thank you. So we've come up with what we call the interview bill of rights. And, and this is something that, that, that helps understand where we're going to go next in our discussion. And I'll go through this real quick, but um, it's really the, the, the impact of this is to make sure your message is heard. And, and by that, I mean making, it's one thing for me to stand up here and talk, but you've heard me say over and over again certain words, certain key phrases. And the reason for that is because I want to make sure that you're hearing what I'm saying and that the message is being heard. So there's, there's elements of this that will help you. Uh, one, obviously, be, co be confident. Um, we want to be honest and concise. Never, never lie. Um, you know, th that's the worst thing that could happen, especially in a crisis situation, because now all of a sudden, in the instance of our, our, our I don't know why I keep talk, pointing to you, but I am, uh, in, in the instance of our example of stealing a truck, 
uh, if I would go on there and say, oh, no, 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 stuck, no truck was ever stolen, and it comes out that there was, now I become the story, and more importantly, it becomes a bigger story. Why is this guy lying? Why, what are they hiding? Why, are they, why can't they just simply tell me a vehicle was stolen? You know, so make sure that you're being honest with that. Um, to establish credibility, there is some real simple steps to go through. And, and I'll say this too, before I go into this, um, this approach can help you with your employees, your team, your wife or husband. How you go about and follow this, this approach can literally, is not just for crisis situation. It can be used for daily communication. Um, and, and I say that just so that it's, it's broader than what we're talking about here today. But we're gonna talk with a single voice, a simple message, and most importantly, like I said before, we are never gonna say no comment. Like I said, I already said it, I'll say it again. You, you've got your crisis communications plan, you've got your messaging in place, you've got your story to tell, why wouldn't you tell it? Why would you go on there and hide behind two silly words that are not gonna help you at all? And to that point, Russ, you said it yourself earlier, the example you gave. Went out to the job, you're on the job, you told folks, hey, stay over here, this is safe. We don't know anything right now, but when we do, we'll get back to you. Perfect, hand, perfect management of the media. And then more importantly, it's okay to say I don't know. We all work in, 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 in offices and, and to actually sit in a meeting and actually have somebody say I don't know, I mean, when was the last time that happened? It doesn't happen that often, right? Because we're so, in, it, it, it's, in our, it's in our psyche to not say those three words. But when you're talking to the media, it's perfectly fine to say I don't know. I'm gonna get back to you. Let me, let, me, let me do my job to help you do yours, okay? Any questions, comments? Yes? Yes, <laughs> and I would even go, take it one step further and appoint one, point one spokesperson or one, one communication lead, um, whatever you want to call it, but absolutely, and, and, and uh, that's a really good point with joint ventures, having that part of the contract as well. Who's taking the lead? What's gonna be the, the element of discussion? Um, how much time do we need to prepare? Those type of things I think are very vital to that, and that's a really good point. Thank you. Any other questions? Any thoughts? All right. Okay, now, this is what we all came for. And I apologize for taking so long to get to here. But now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to speak with the media and, and why it's important. As you've heard so far, you know, we, we've pulled all this together, look, thinking about a crisis communications plan, our messaging, our story. We've done all these things. Why wouldn't we go and talk to the media? And, and that's, you know, you're preparing, you're doing all of these things, it's the opportunity to share our side of the story. So, typically when I say this, and I'm gonna read this, an interview is not an intellectual exercise. It's an opportunity to deliver specific messages to specific audiences with the reporter as the conduit. Those are the three most, uh, four most important words on that sheet, slide. I can't count. <laughs> the reporter is the one that's doing your job for you. And this is where it starts to get a little bit different in terms of, of a mindset shift. If you think of the person that is standing in front of you and doing the reporting as the person that's gonna help you, one, that makes your job a lot easier, kind of calms it down a little bit, but most importantly, that, re that reporter has access to however many people. So use that person as a way to get your story out. Does this make sense? Does anyone disagree with it? 
You can if you'd like. Okay. So, the key here is to say what you want your audience to know. So again, using the example that we have of uh, vehicle theft, what I would say is, yes, we had a vehicle theft. We know the vehicle was a Ford F-150, has our logo on the side, had equipment in it, and then I would come back and say, yes, we did have a vehicle theft. And the reason I say that is because there are multiple ways, the reporter is going to hear a couple things. The reporter is going to hear you acknowledge the fact that there was, a, there was an incident. Then he's going to also, he or she is going to also hear that there's more detail that I can try to go after. And then by reiterating the fact that there was an incident, you're acknowledging it, and you're also kind of laying the, the groundwork for future conversations by admitting that there was an issue. Does that make sense? OK. All right. So last thing here in terms of these slides, not quite done. But what I just said to you Yes, we had a vehicle theft. The truck was an F-150. It had our logo on the side. There was, some, there was some equipment inside. And yes, we did have a vehicle theft. That took all of 10 seconds, plus or minus. Um, so as you're, as you're thinking about communicating with a reporter, that's about the length of time that you have. You've got 10 to 15 seconds to really get it across and hit home what it is that you want someone to, to understand. And again, going back to the previous slide, the reporter's the conduit. I want the audience to know that we've done this, and now I'm, ta I'm speaking very succinctly, very focused. Okay? So I want to spend a little bit more time talking about packaged answers. Okay? And that's what I just did. I just gave you a packaged answer. And the, what I did, and you can see my lovely assistant there is a little bit quizzical, questioning, what's, what's this clown talking about? Um, the way to prepare and provide these packaged answers is to lead with a key message. So in the instance, I, in the example that we've been using, yes, we had a vehicle theft. That was my key message. Now, I've backed it up with some facts. It's a white truck. It's got our logo on the side. It was an F-150. Um, we may have the license plate, that type of thing. Um, there was some equipment in the back, maybe a ladder on the side. I'm being very general, I know. Those are the facts that supported it. And then I closed with that key message. Yes, we did have a vehicle theft. So that packaged answer comes back to the very first thing that I said today. And that is, if I say that, there's no way that if Zach is, my, is the reporter interviewing me, he can't get anything out of what I said, other than, yeah, there was a car, th a car theft, a vehicle theft. And here are some details, and that's it. Yes? <laughs> very, yeah, it's a very good point, yes. And if I was in that situation, I would say, well, first off, very good question, thank you. Um, we are in the middle of an investigation. This event occurred three hours ago. We, we, our priority is making sure that our employees are safe, the job site is safe and secure, and then more importantly, we're still finding what, it, what, what the issues are. I can assure you, when we have those issues, we will respond to that. I don't know at this time. 
And so, so because, and, and that's a good question, because a lot of the times reporters are going to think, you know, why? How can, how can this be? You should know this. Well, the reality of it is, is the person standing in front of them or granting the interview wasn't there. <laughs> so that's the other side of that. And, and it's okay to say that. Like, it's, it's okay to say, hey, look, I wasn't there. I'm trying to help you do your job. Just like you're trying to help me do my job, I need to find that information out. You know, th and my hope is when you walk out of here that you, you recognize that the, a, a reporter is doing a job. And just like, you know, I, I have to admit I don't know your company name, but like if, if you're an engineer and you're working on a project, you're talking to the architect, you're talking to some subcontractors, you're doing all these things, you know, in those pre-bid meetings, you're going back and forth there's nothing wrong with, with standing your ground and saying, look, I don't know, pal. I'm trying to help you. You know, it's okay to do that. Um, and if they, you know, for some reason would report that, shame on them because they're just trying to cause issues. Uh, yes, sir. Bingo. Exactly. Exactly. And I, actually, I remember there was one. I, I live in Sewickley, and there was a there was an incident. Oh, I don't know, four or five years ago, there was a. Um, I think it was at Sewickley Academy. They were building something. There was so, something something going on. I forget exactly where. But somebody brought. The, they, there was an argument on the job site. Guy went to his truck and came back with a gun. Well, exactly what happened. What you just said happened. They came back and they were like, "Well, wait a second. He thought they thought he was going for drugs and all this other stuff. Next thing you know, it becomes a bigger story, and it's it really wasn't a story. Uh, but you're right. Um, I always say I don't know is your is your ticket out of jail. It just alleviates everything. And and more importantly, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying it over and over and over again. Um, you know, I've kind of backed away from it, but in the past I was kind of a news junkie and I would watch the poli you know, politicians and, and, uh, and going through all the press conferences and all these other things during, during campaigns and even local campaigns and uh, it's a perfect example of where people go out there and they step on themselves and they keep talking just because they don't know what to do. They just keep, uh, oh my God, I panic and oh my God, I gotta, I gotta get out of here, you know. Uh, uh, no, just three words and you're good. I, I, I don't know. But I'll find out for you, you know, and, and goes from there. Um, so, uh, to, uh, thank you, because those were those were very good, 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 good examples. Um, and, and to your point, yes, the reporters will push. They're going to ask, especially over time. Um, but if you take the time to prepare and you think about it, and then more importantly, you have your packaged answers. Now you're in a position that you can actually respond and get out. And, and, you know, there, there's an, an adage in, in media training and communications, you know, do no damage. And that's the, that's the ideal for a spokesperson is to give information and do no damage and get out. Does that make sense? So, package answers. Any questions about this? Because this is honestly, this is the, this is, this is the bulk of really how to handle the how to how to talk with the reporters, how to manage a situation. And, and I'll reiterate it again: it's lead with your key message, back it up with facts, data, support, and then say that key message again. And and I'll, I'll be honest: that's the hardest part, is is reiterating that last key message. And as you can see, she's getting it. The challenge there is, is always ending with that key message. And, and again, under the example that we have here, yes, a vehicle was stolen. It was a Ford F-150. It had um, a ladder on the side, had our logo, had some equipment in the back. And, and again, yes, we did have a vehicle theft and we're working with authorities if you, if you wanted to go that far. Um, but the biggest challenge and, and why that is a challenge is it allows you to finish up what you're saying 
and then be quiet. And, and I'll tell you, <clears throat> it's funny. Um, every media training session I've given, literally getting someone to stop talking is the hardest thing in the world. It is damn near impossible to get somebody to stop talking, especially when they get nervous. And we, do, we, we actually would videotape it and we'll show people when you're going through that. Um, but the idea is if you use package answers, and again, you lead with your key message, facts and figures, support it, lead with that, and end with that key message, you don't have any reason to be nervous. You don't have any reason to give misinformation. And most importantly, you don't do any damage. Any thoughts? Comments? Questions? And probably the most important element of packaging, packaged answers. There's no question. The reporter and, and you as an example, you understand what I'm saying. There's no question about what it is that occurred in our response. OK? So almost done. A couple more slides, and we're just going to end, end this now. So if you have questions, I've been asking. If you have questions, fire away. <laughs> so a couple things to take away today. One. Establish a crisis communications plan. It's going to be valuable as you move forward. Um, you know, add it to your safety program. Uh, build upon it. Practice it. Review it. Update it. Uh, secondly, understand the media expectations. Understand what they're looking for from you. Uh, hopefully, you never have to go through this as well. But understanding that the media is there to get, a, get information from you, and if you use them as that conduit to tell your story, all is right in the world. Know your rights. We talked about the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, understanding that you have a job and you control the information. It's yours. Nobody else's. And once you understand that, now you can help the media do their job as you understand their expectations. We talked about packaging your answers. Um, and if you would like, want to talk about that after, we can talk a little bit more about that. I can give you some you know, specific examples if that's necessary, if you'd like. Um, and I can't emphasize this enough. Practice, practice, practice. I've probably given this presentation probably 20 times. Um, and I, my wife has heard it probably 15. Um, just last night, I was practicing it again. You know, and she's like, trust me, you've got it. Please, I don't want to hear about this anymore. My point is practice. Because once you have cameras in front of you and you're doing you know, interviews and, and all sorts of elements of things, you're going to get, you're going to get panicky. You're going to get nervous. Um, and more importantly, you're going to forget things. So the more you practice, the, more it's going to be, the better it's going to be. And most importantly, I would even encourage you to do this. Get your leadership. Get your, we talked about crisis team. Have them involved in it, too. Um, in fact, I'll share a quick anecdote, a quick story. Um, we had a, um, a client out in the Midwest. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, they wanted to go through crisis communications training. And the CEO kind of was like, yeah, I don't need it. I've talked to the media enough. Um, so what we ended up doing was we worked with their communications director, and we actually hijacked the CEO. And, and by that, I mean um, he was out to dinner on a Saturday night with his wife. And we ran into the, the restaurant with a cameraman. I was playing the interviewer, and we literally were like, can you tell us what happened on your job site today? And the cameraman was right there. And literally, the guy it looked like deer in the headlights. He didn't understand what was going on. We followed him to his car. We ran after him as he was driving away with his wife. And you could see them exchanging. And it's actually very funny, because they're in the, in the video. And his wife is yelling at him for not being, you know, what's going on? What, how could you do this to us? And all these other things. My, the point and the reason I bring it up is practice. Because if you, are, if you don't even think about those types of instances, I mean, think about it. The guy's out at, out at dinner on a Saturday night enjoying his time with his wife. 
And next thing you know, boom, there's a microphone in his face, camera crew, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. He had no idea what to do. But it, that's an extreme, I admit. That is very much an extreme. However, be prepared and practice. I can't emphasize that enough. Last slide, and don't, please don't ask me why this is from Stephen King, but it, it, it actually fits, okay? <laughs> the quote is, there's no harm in hoping for the best as long as you're pre prepared for the worst. Um, very apropos for what we talked about today, and I hope that when we go back to the beginning of this, the expectations that we talked about were helpful for you. Um, and, and actually, when you go out in the, uh, outside of the building today, you're more confident in how to communicate with the, the media. Yes? So the one thing that we uh, held off the table, but the worst case scenario, someone dies on your job. Um, you know, that's a different, that's a whole other situation. Yeah. How do you handle that? And what do you say so that you don't look, um, you know, like you don't care? I mean, because you yeah. may care, but also that you don't want to say things that are inaccurate. Right, right. That, you're right, and I have tried to avoid that. Um, the first thing is you, obviously, you, you always want to acknowledge the fact that it occurred. And, and there's so many different ways you could say that. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, we did have a fatality. And our company is at this time very focused on the family and friends of and if, if you make the corporate decision to actually release that person's name or, or you, know, that, that, you know, that would be part of the crisis communications plan. Um, and then what I would say after that, if I was scripting it out, is I would say, you know, our company values safety and we're very focused on that. Unfortunately, we had an accident and we are looking into making our job sites even safer, uh, assuming it's on a job site. Um, but, but, but really, helping understand that, yes, there was an incident, an incident, we're working on it. And, and again, that whole packaged answer approach. Acknowledge the fact that something happened, give supporting elements, and then come back again. Um, and, and, you know, some of the supporting elements, if you've won safety awards, um, if you've, you know, if, you're, if you invest X amount of dollars in your safety programs, um, you know, support it from, from that perspective so that you're actually having the ability to, to lend credibility to the fact that the company, this, this doesn't happen every day at our job sites or our company, um, and, and go from there. Did, did, did I answer that for you? Okay, all right. Any, any, other, any other thoughts, comments? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking time to come in today. Um, and and I, I hats off to you for, for making this a priority because a lot of people don't typically do this and make this a priority. Um, but uh, again, thank you for taking the time to come in. Uh, if you have any questions, by all means, please uh, let me know. Um, and if you don't want to talk today, you can grab a card. I have them somewhere. They're up here. Um, and uh, we can talk from there. Thanks, so, Thank you.